we are live and man am i excited uh man this guy he has he has been a part of my life in ways he did not know <laughs> uh comic book artist uh as you know as i'm a, such a big fan and uh, grew up with this stuff um he's done covers he's also transitioned into animation and storyboard work on films and projects that you're familiar with um great uh resume of incredible work as an artist and now he has a new as you can see right there a little bit of, i tried to get the thumbnail to kind of be behind us there the the lori lovecraft ominous is coming in just a few weeks we'll be able to try to give you a little preview of some of that so you can kind of have that on your radar screen mike vosberg vaz and, and i'm so thankful for you to fit us in man thank you mike and uh being with us man hanging out well thank you so much for having me here today um, so when did it all begin when did you like say listen i think i want to draw for a living it's like you had to have that moment with your family or was it just something you were just doing or how to get to that point where you're like mm, i think that's kind of what i want to do well, when i was in uh I was probably in sixth grade i met my friend fred jackson and fred started showing me he was like yeah i draw my own homemade comics uh and uh i was just like wow really how do you do that? So, you know, we, we started, we started our own little company, you know, Vosberg and Jackson called Voxen. And we would do these little, uh, homemade comics and trade them back and forth. Uh, mm. you know, that one here someplace that, uh, I mean, they were, they were like, so, um, they were kid stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that always amuses me is people would are will tell young artists, you have to have talent to do this. <laughs> I'll bring in my comics and show them to kids and go, hey, look, there's hope for that kid. There's hope for anybody, you know, because it was uh, um, we all start someplace. And um, about the same time that I was drawing all my comics with Fred, I had the good fortune to be living in the Detroit area and which was the birthplace of comic book fandom because there was a professor uh, there named Jerry Bales. Jerry was a great guy. Um, and um, he started putting out uh, the fanzine alter ego. And of course I, you know, sent him my, uh, whatever it was, 25 cents or whatever. And, you know, got a copy and, mm -hmm. and immediately got on the phone with him Cause he was only 20 miles away and, and was asking, well, how do you do this? I want to do my own fanzine. Um, and he was very helpful. He was always a, you know, a mentor of sorts in that way. Um, and, oh, through my high school years, I was doing one of the very first comic book fan scenes called Masquerader. Uh, and by doing that, that, I think I met everybody I was going to work with in the industry for the next 10, 15 years. And this was one of these, one of the little, um, uh, one of the issues. That's uh, so awesome. This, well, this shows you, you know, like this is high tech right here because uh, we were doing it on what they called spirit duplicators, which was as, as kids, that's how we got all our homework. You know, it was, it was uh, you know, you just you'd put it, you'd, you'd put it on a master, you'd crank out the number sheet. It lasts about 300 copies. Well, I had three different artists drawing this cover. So I had to like get a master and send it to one. They had to send it to the next person. They had to send it to the next person. At any point, if the post office screwed up, we were dead. <laughs> is that um? Is that like the machine with the drum? And when you would do it, it would spin around. Yeah. We called it a ditto machine, but I go, it definitely evolved over the years. Yeah, and yes. and you had to be careful when you were putting on that master because if you didn't get it on right, it mm -hmm. would you know crinkle. So if you had a drawing yep. like that. You could ruin it so easily. Oh my gosh, kids! You don't know. It's so funny because this is all pre, you know, like copy machines. So why don't we have scanners in our house now? But just the idea that you know, you're so right. I remember the Ditto machines. Wow, that's crazy to figure out how to line it up. I'm trying to think that through. That's just that's crazy that that's actually what you had to do for like 300 copies. Up, so start again. It's like wow, that's crazy. Well, I didn't have to worry about making more than 300 copies because that was kind of you know that was the print run in those days. Yeah, that's amazing. So that gets you into high school and that kind of thing. And uh, 
when you when you were doing that, what was like the family's reaction and stuff? Because I mean, obviously, there's people right now, you know, their kids and whatever, and the internet's kind of made everything so different. People want to really chase, you know, chase their dreams and be creative, be artistic, and all of that. But you know, there's always gonna be pushback. What do you what do you say to those kids? What did you go through? What was it like with um, you know mom and dad or family? Be like, eh, you know, Mike, mom um, and dad. I talked about talent, you know, in terms of having talent. If I had a talent with that, I had talent. Our parents had supported me. Awesome. So they were always very, you know, my dad was a janitor. He made sure I had access to that, you know, that ditto machine at the school where he worked at. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, you know, it was it was always that kind of thing. I always made sure we had paper to draw on at home, you know. With right. That. Um, and uh, they were very supportive. Teachers, you got to remember, I grew up in a, in a, in a car town in, a, in Pontiac, Michigan, where, you know, you were, if you were smart, or I was going to say, you know, it's like you're going to start, you were going to work on the line when you got out. If you were smart, you were going to work in the office. Gotcha. Or something related to that. So the idea that I wanted to, you know, that I wanted to draw comics was, was kind of like, I think I'm going to go to Hollywood and become an actor. It was a pipe dream. Sure. What, what made it real for me was in Detroit, I had this whole circle of, of guys that I met through, you know, uh, like I said, in, in um, um, like Al Milgram and uh, Jim Starlin was one of the first ones I met. He was like, when he was 13, I was like a senior in high school. I remember he hitchhiked out to my house from uh, where he lived in Berkeley, about 20 miles away and said, Hey, I heard you did fanzines, you know? And, uh, um, and I remember, you know, giving him a ride home and we became good friends and, uh, you know, we were, we were always, you know, like, like doing different things and showing each other. And when I saw, you know, like a few years later, I mean, I went to, to, um, um, you know, after high school, I went to college, got a degree in, in, uh, education and, uh, English literature and taught school for, uh, three years. And during that time, you know, suddenly I saw Jim develop into those artists and he's getting work and it made it real for me. It mm. made me understand that, Oh wait, this isn't just, uh, you know, a, a pipe dream that you can do. This is, you can actually try this. Um, and the idea that I was actually going to go forward with that was really youthful arrogance because I had absolutely no conception on how to draw. I know a lot of people still think I don't, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so, I mean, I, I didn't have any of that training in high school. I mean, we had one art course, I think, in high school. And that was basically where they spent, like, the, the discipline problems. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's like, like we had, you know, those guys and then us. And, um, it, you know, it was fun. But, um, and, and the whole concept of storytelling, that was, like, beyond comprehension for anyone. I mean, in terms of, in terms of, um, of trying to, to, to teach that stuff. And I think actually my English lit um, degree probably was a lot more helpful to me as a comic book artist than uh, any art class I would have taken. Because it taught because, me I, I was going to ask you that. It like helps you, it, it definitely broadened your horizons in storytelling, you know, the heroic archetypes, you know, the different, different type of elements that you need to have a decent story. Now you, now you kind of know what some of the key elements are. And the other thing for me was I was a big movie fan. I, I didn't have TV till I was about 12 or 13, but my parents usually took us to, you know, movies on Friday night and we'd see like a, you know, double feature Westerns, cartoons, whatever. And me, that was like going to church. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just like the height of the experience you could have. So I think as a storyteller, um, like I said, my English lit background and movies were far more influential to me than, uh, I read a ton of comics, but, my favorite comics were Classics Illustrated, uh, you know, and um, uh, geez, what else? Mystery comics, things like that. Um, so, like I said, when I started hanging around with guys like uh, Starlin, Milgram, we had Terry Austin, Arvel Jones, uh, God, who else was in there? Rich Buckler, uh, Tom Orzakowski, the letterer. Um, I mean, we had a slew of Arby, uh, Aubrey Bradford. He was a little bit younger than I was, but uh, all these guys came along and we all fostered each other. I mean, you know, they, we would look at each other's work, give each other, you know, criticism of sorts and encouragement. And 
uh, if, if one of us, you know, when one of us made it in terms of like, you know, getting work from Marvel or DC or wherever, when you went into the city, they were there to give you a helping hand. It wasn't like, you know, you're on your own. Good luck. I mean, um, all those guys were really, uh, you know, they were part of kind of a a family that really sounds like it pushes forward. Let me say hi to Apollo Me's minion that's been in here. Darius Munchausen's in here. So people have been kind of popping in and out. And if you guys have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll try to uh, circle back around in between as we have some gaps. We've been reflecting on, you know, how Mike kind of grappled with the idea of, of being an artist and professionally and, you know, leaving behind the pipe dream and having to become reality. I think that's great. I didn't, I did, I dropped the ball a little bit, Mike, be honest with you. Confession time with my son. I told you he went to art school, whatever. And I wasn't the most supportive parent because he was going to a private school where it was going to involve a pretty big loan. And I didn't, I kind of didn't handle it well, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, he's proven me wrong. I'm so proud of him. He's gone. He's got a career. He's been doing these advertising stuff, making decent money. Good job. Gotten raises and promotions. So, you know, as parents, you know, we got to live and learn. And uh, be as supportive as we can and know that uh, the world's different now. That's one of the things I didn't get my head around as fast enough. I wish I'd been a little better. But uh, now it's great to see creators like yourself coming back and sharing stories and advice, artwork, revisiting different things. And uh, it's awesome. So like I said earlier, I think when I first saw you, let's see, let me let me share one of my. Oh, I don't have it open. I got to open it while we're talking. Um, so let me ask you how to if you could while I'm find in my photo that I downloaded. Uh, talk about the difference of companies and stuff in the industry. Because there's so many, you know, accusations and different things that are said and done about how these companies uh, pay people, how they treat people and those kinds of things. Just a general thing. And I don't, you know, I'm not here to th- ask you to throw mud or anything like that. Just a general idea of like, you know, what it was like and what some of your experiences were kind of like working for different companies? Because the cultures definitely sound completely different in different ways. Well, um, when I started out, there was Gold Key, Charlton, DC, and Marvel. But basically, that's where you could work for. Uh, And my first jobs were for Gold Key, who was Dell Comics, and it was doing uh, mystery stories here and there. And I just, you know, got my foot in the door. Um, The other thing I was doing, strangely enough at the time, was, but the independent stuff were the um, in what they call underground comics, um, which you didn't make much money, but at least you got to learn a little bit about the the um, you know the reproduction process of of doing a drawing on a board and seeing what it looks like when it actually goes to print. Um, but the companies themselves, I think the hardest thing that we had to get through as as young artists was. Um, like I said, the artists were all family. The companies were not our families. And for so many of us, um, we didn't understand that. I mean, you know, you thought I'm working for Marvel. They're all right. You know, they're always going to take care of me. And the reality was when we came into Marvel, the first thing we're doing was getting rid of a whole lot of older guys that, you know, well, you don't really quite fit the way we're doing things now. Um, and it was kind of, that was a standard process in comics. I mean, it was, it was, um, um, it was very much a mom and pop organization. I think, I mean, Marvel was just a small company and, um, um, while I wasn't, I can't say I was a big Stan Lee fan. Uh, he was an expert at creating hype and creating an interest in the material. Uh, At a time when comics themselves were just, you know, they were hanging on by a thread. When TV came in in the 50s, that was pretty much, you know, like the writing was on the wall for the comic book industry. Um, How are you going to get kids interested in reading a comic book when they can watch something on TV that talks and moves? Um, Video games in the 80s and 90s took that even further. Um, I mean, I'm always in, I'm always amused when I run into people who tell me about like you know comics. So that's a big business, and I'm going. Uh, as far as I know, the comics died in the '80s or '90s, and there's still a lot of people making great living off the corpse. But um, you know, the books themselves, I don't think there's any new creative uh, material going in. Um, no one I know makes a living 
drawing comics. Uh, you can make a living off the ancillary stuff of comics. Right. But I mean, it, it's like uh, anything Marvel or DC has done for the past 10, 15 years. It's basically paid advertising for all the movies that they put out. Yeah. Um, right. So, I mean, um, guys your age are kind of, they're, they're the audience, uh, I mean, for a lot of the comic book work. And every year they're getting, that audience is getting a little bit smaller and smaller. Sure. Um, one of the oddities that I find now that I find just fascinating is that when I was a kid, I was talking about my friend Fred Jackson and myself, and I swear we were the only two guys in Pontiac that were drawing our own comic books. Um, you know, nobody did that kind of stuff. And now I run into kids and everybody's doing their own little comics. Um, and pretty much the same way I did them when I was a kid. I mean, just getting a sheet of typewriter paper and, and you know, either, you know, a, a splitting it in half or drawing on it and, and, and drawing your little stories on there and then stapling it together. Um, and I find that um, comics is, I don't know what you call them, a genre, an art form or whatever, um, are, are really fascinating because they're the easiest and the cheapest and the most egocentric way you can put your creations together. I mean, if you want to work on film or something, you got to have somebody hold the camera, you got to have somebody act, you got to bring all these people together. Comics, you can just grab, you know, your paper and your pencil and, and go into your room and lock the door and you got your own little world and you can work on that. And I think that constantly appeals to, uh, you know, uh, younger kids. And you can do your own ideas. You don't have to, you know, um, you don't need somebody else to come in and, and give you the stuff to work on. I, I've lost the sound there, Brandon. I can't hear you there. I left myself on mute. My fault. I'm boomerang, folks. No surprise for the people that have been are here. They all know I do it regularly. <laughs> I muted myself. I was going to uh, asking. Um, what, I'm used to being what, muted, but I'm not used to other people. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't let my, I wouldn't let the first lady have control of the mic. She'd be shutting me down regularly. That would be okay. uh, um, the collaborative process. Like, how did that work? Because you know, people now, some of these creators are like they're remote. They're working in different cities. You have, I think, DC just announced closing one of their their big offices there in California. That's kind of thing. How was the collaborative process for you as, during those years? Do you guys did you have certain offices that you worked in? You know, how was it working? You know, like I said, I, I first found you through GI Joe with your work with Larry Larry Hama and this kind of era. And then, of course, that's when I found a lot of your other work. So, how did that collaborative process work for you? Well, first off, I was. A bit of an oddity in that I was I was living in Michigan and working through the mails, and okay. I would go into New York and 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 meet with people. But I mean, um, most of the writers I worked with I rarely met, and I mean I would get a script every month and I'd work on that. Um, mm -hmm. The companies weren't going to pay for long distance calls in those days. Right. I mean, you didn't have these long story conferences. Um, and it, it was definitely, you know, detrimental to my career. Um, and uh, I'm maybe thankful for that in a way. Um, and But um, I found the best writers I worked with were guys who actually drew. Hmm. Um, and I mean, so obviously like like Chaykin. Working on Chaykin's scripts were a piece of cake because he thought of everything. I didn't say scripts, his, his plots. He thought of everything as a series of pictures. Okay. Um, what you wanted to avoid were, were guys who wanted to write prose and, you know, had no concept that when you draw a picture, only one thing can happen at a time. You know, you're, you'd get these things like Batman rushes in, he turns off his TV and then he picks up the newspaper. He starts to read it while he puts on his shirt and I'm going, you can't do that in one frame. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a lot I, of different things happening. <laughs> um, so, I mean, um, and comics themselves, they're not, the writing is important um, in terms of concepts and ideas, but the stories are visual. Same thing with film. You're looking at this material. The words are there as kind of icing on the cake and to pull things together. Um, and 
I also found it interesting, uh, you know, working in comics that um, the writers all became editors and they kind of controlled the business. Um, Stan definitely had a great idea in terms of just calling guys in going, hey, I, great, I got a great idea, take it home and, uh, you know, bring it back. Let me, you know, let me know where it goes. Right. Um, you know, the bad side of that was after they brought it back and they put in all the work then you know, Stan got his name at the top. But um, in terms of a way to work with comics, it, it definitely made more sense. Hmm. Um, Larry was interesting because I knew Larry when I go into New York, I'd go to uh, Neil's continuity studio because that was kind of the, the place where Neil always made you welcome there. I mean, uh, it was just, it was great. I mean, you know, as an artist, you got to come in, you could hang out with all these, you know, like Dick Giordano and, and, uh, gosh, who else there worked there? Um, um, geez, there was, there was Ralph Reese, Larry, uh, Joe Rubenstein was there at one time. Uh, Jack Abel was just like a prince. Uh, he was great to work with. So, I mean, you could sit down, you could talk with these guys, see what they were doing, you know? And, um, so, um, I knew Larry, but he always seemed a little forbidding to me. Just, uh, you know, just, uh, as, and, um, working on GI Joe was interesting because he was another guy. His scripts were just great to work on because everything, everything was so visual in a series of pictures and the mm -hmm. stories were also really fascinating. And he understood the material. Uh, I mean, quite honestly, I, you know, for me, the difference between a gun was, uh, you know, one, I, I knew the difference between an automatic and a revolver and a, you know, and a rifle and machine gun, maybe. But that's about it. Um, Larry understood all the machinery. Um, but he was, he, was also, he was also very, I rarely got, ever got comments from him on the work. And I always thought, you know, I thought he doesn't like this stuff very much. And, you know, mm -hmm. years later, we had another conversation where we met. And he was like, oh, no, I always liked your stuff. But I grew up working for Wally Wood. And. His attitude was, um, you don't have to talk to the artist unless something's going wrong. Yeah, so, if it's going right, don't rock the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah Christian, um, it's been great. To, it's great having uh, these kind of conversations. He he says he loves the history of comic. Yeah, me too, man. Me too, brother. This is like part of my life, so it's great. And Jace Fox, my my uh, fellowship fandom son, is on here. <laughs> it's, he, he calls me the father, the new, the adopted father of the fellowship, as I'm trying to. I guess I have, I believe in such a mentoring mindset. We kind of talked about that before the show a little bit about just trying to encourage people and whatever. And uh, how? So let me uh, let me wrap put a bow on this part because I'm just fascinated. Because with GI Joe, you guys did create characters like whole cloth, right? Because I was going through that era that I was like I showed you the I pulled up the one one cover for you guys, but like Doctor Venom, for instance, or something like that. You guys basically helped co created these kinds of things what framework did they give you or kind of help you with like the art part of some of that? Okay. First off, um, Larry created those and probably had Ed Hannigan do a, a good part of the original, um, you know, visual work on it. I had oh, okay. very little, if anything to do. Okay. The only thing I did with Dr. Venom was I cast uh, Peter Cushing to play him when I drew her. <laughs> Perfect. And I mean, that Perfect. was my whole whole approach with any of the comics I did. Was I always cast artists? I mean, I, I cast actors as, um, you know, different actors that I thought, oh, it'd be great to draw him. Yeah. You know, it's like I think when I was drawing GI Joe, certainly I was thinking Burt Lancaster with either Hawk or uh, Duke, one of those, and you know, I, I approached him that way. Okay. Um. So. Um, yeah. You know, Doctor Venom. He was he was just kind of this evil scientist, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of actually creating any of the characters, um, that wasn't actually something I did. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So the really fascinating part about your career, though, is how you transitioned away from comics back then into animation, into storyboard work, that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, I know you've done this a little bit in other interviews and I hate being redundant, but help people understand a little bit about how that transition happened for you. Like what was the first steps and kind of your first, uh, jumping off point? Well, it was basically two steps. Uh, one is I moved from, uh, I, I met my wife who's just backing out of the driveway in her car now. Um, um, I, I met my wife and when we were married, you know, month after we got married, we moved out to California. Um, and the second part of it was, um, 
I was joking to say, uh, you know, who's that? Uh, Julie Andrews, when she won the Oscar for uh, Mary Poppins, Jack Warner had passed her over for uh, My Fair Lady, where she made a, you know, a big splash. She held up the Oscar and she said, I'd like to thank Jack Warner for this. And uh, so when I think of my animation career, I always say, I'd like to thank uh, Jim Shooter for this. Because um, uh, when I started working at Marvel, I somehow managed to uh, get on Jim's list of people that we really don't need. Um, so I could kind of see my career in comics in that sense was, um, uh, it was going to be more and more difficult. So when I moved out to California, there were all these different opportunities to work in storyboard, advertising, or whatever. And so I started to, you know, to segue into uh, doing that. What made it supremely easy was I was working on a book at the time called Sisterhood of the Steel, mm -hmm. which was a creator-owned book that myself and Christy Marks did. Well, unbeknownst to probably most comic book people, Christy Marks was also the lead writer for all the Hasbro stuff. She created probably a good part of the gem world and material. And she was also one of the major writers on G.I. Joe. Hmm. So, and, and I had been drawn to G.I. Joe comic book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a no brainer that I went into Marvel and said, you know, Hey, I'd, I'd like to do storyboards. And of course their reaction was, uh, no, you draw comics. You don't know how to draw storyboards. And, uh, um, so I went, okay. And, um, I asked one of my friends who drew storyboards, uh, uh, Warren Greenwood, um, and he said, oh, Mike, you want to draw storyboards? Uh, I could probably teach you everything you need to know in about an hour. And I mean, I was getting these different, you know, uh, um, reactions from, uh, you know, from management and from, from talent or whatever. So finally at Marvel, things were just booming so much they needed artists. And they said, hey, look, um, we'll give you a job and you can apprentice to somebody. And you can, you know, they'll teach you, you know, you can learn slowly how to do storyboards mm -hmm. from them. Um, and, and, you know, and they said, well, yeah, we want to hire you, but unfortunately we don't have anybody you can apprentice with. So what we'll do is we'll get you a script and you can come in and, and you can work with a couple people here and you'll go through that. <laughs> and when I showed up to get the script, they went, oh, we really don't have anybody to show you that stuff. So yep, just, no one's here to train you today. You're on your own. <laughs> take it home, do it, bring it back and, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Well, I took it home. I did it. I brought it back and like, they went, oh, wow, you're hired. And, That's awesome, Mike. Well, it, it, uh, no. it's, so, it's so real life, too. Like every job I've ever had, it's always like, yeah, we're going to go through these weeks of training or whatever. And most of the time you're like, all right, well, you start today. Here you go. Well, I thought I was going to be training with somebody. Yeah, there's no one here to train you today. You just got to be good. <laughs> You'll be, you can handle it, right? <laughs> well, well, what I discovered was that the storytelling process between film and comics is very similar. Mm -hmm. there's, there's really major but small changes. I mean, one thing in comics, the work is static. It's on the page. It's going to stay there. In film, everything continues to move. In comics, you can draw panels of all different sizes. In film, you have one static frame you're going to work with the whole time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the other thing they were very, very concerned about uh, was also, you know, was screen direction. If you entered on the left, you stayed on the left. Mm -hmm. uh, in comic books, nobody cared about that. You could enter on the left. You could come back on the right, you know. Um, because between the two frames, as Scott McCloud pointed out to us, there's a huge world that goes on. Mm. Whereas in film, it's all instantaneous. So it's if you go out on the left and you come back on the left again, people are going, huh, where'd he come from? You know, is, you know, and, and, um, so there were little things like that to learn. Um, but for the most part that, you know, it was. Um, it, it went very, very smoothly for me. Um, and uh, the other thing was that, that in comics at the time, you had to learn how to draw well and you had to learn how to draw quickly. Mm -hmm. So when I started working in animation, the other big issue were just keeping up with the deadlines. Right. And uh, the first thing I discovered was I had two weeks to do a show. It rarely took me more than about five to six days. Oh, wow. Awesome. Well, I think the drawing that would slow down a lot of folks um, went very quickly for me, and you know, for better or for worse, I didn't second get my or second guess myself a lot in terms of 
oh, how should I approach this? How should I approach that? And as I mentioned earlier, my biggest influence as a kid was movies. So, I mean, I was constantly mm -hmm. watching movies and seeing how, you know, and bringing that into my comics at the time, mm -hmm. even before I started, in, you know, in animation. So I understood that process of, you know, what is the pan? How do you move in? How do you move out? All the uh, the film techniques to use, uh, they were things I was I was pretty much familiar with. We had a comment in the chat I want to come back to. You. Um, Jay says he'd like to get together with you and Chuck Dixon. And I don't know how my name got in there. I, I do not deserve Jace to be in that conversation. That there that's way above my uh, my league. Uh, but he asked, well, if you had a favorite comic book or a character that you uh, you enjoyed the most doing, um, the ones I create. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. The ones that the ones that you well, own, right? Who was your favorite Marvel character? And I'm going whichever what, one I didn't have to draw. Which, whichever one, yeah. Um, no, I I was not. For one thing, I never read Marvel comics when they first came out. I mean, it was I I was reading the DC material, and I was reading. For me, I was a major Joe Kubert fan, so I absolutely loved uh, Hawkman. But I loved Hawkman because. It was this noir comic. Mm. Um, and uh, I was a big Jack Kirby fan too, but unfortunately working for Marvel, um, I was never crazy about the way they inked his work. Mm. I, you know, I got spoiled because when I first saw Jack Kirby, he was inked by uh, Wally Wood. And it was this very, you know, uh, very, very slick, uh, great looking product. Um, so... Uh, I think it's always a fun question because when I asked Chuck, uh, he was in a, he was in an interview recently, and I, I just I just in the chat I wasn't actually speaking to him directly, and I asked him about that same question. Basically, he said firestorm, and he was just talking about guys' heads on fire all the time. It just kind of drove me kind of crazy, and just you know, and it's like so I actually kind of thought to myself how sadistic it would be if I ever got to see Chuck again personally and be like, listen, I want you to draw this little firestorm for me or whatever, just because it's like you know how many of these could he have done if he's avoiding the character? It's like I don't know, it's just me. I, I'm just that way. It's a contrarian thing, I guess, in me, but. Uh, yeah. Well, if I like to actually say a favorite character, of course, it's Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And by the way, speaking of Chuck, All right. I, I've been reading his Punisher and and this other thing that he did with uh, Jorge Zafino. And, um, We're all fans. We're all fans. He's oh, such – he's he's the goat, man. He's a goat. I, I don't even – so listen, I kind of joke, Mike. You, you tell me where I'm off base. If I were to take over the Marvel, I mean, uh, the DC Discovery mess of their comic book industry tomorrow, I pick the phone up and I ask Chuck how much money it costs me to tell me what to do to fix Batman. I, he doesn't have to do it. I just need him to tell me how much money do I have to pay? How many lunches do I have to buy you to figure out? You tell me who to hire. How do we fix this mess? And then you call, you know, Grant Morrison and you, you bring back some of the legends and you go, we got to write this ship. You got to do it. And you can, you can teach these new fans and say, listen, I got this guy named Vaz. And he is just going to rock these variant covers. He's going to bring back some stuff. He's going to he's going to take care of some stuff for us. We're going to okay, be good to go. You are so devoid. The uh... <laughs> first off, the only a way man can dream. A man can dream. I retire because it's like he's done it. He's been there. He's like James yeah. Bond. He's like Tarzan. There's no more to tell, folks. Yeah, you know, yeah. bring in the new guy and let him take over. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, secondly, I know. for me. Um, my work is unemotional. Mm. I'm, I want to do continuity. I'm strong at continuity, mm. but I mean, when you get to the graphic images covers, uh, the great covers that you're probably thinking of that I did, I, I you got Ed Hannigan to thank for those. He would do a little rough and send it to me and I draw them. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I didn't know that. But, um, I mean, some of the She-Hulk covers I might have got more involved in, but even those, I think um, Ed might have done some of those. Or, and there were other artists at Marvel who worked in the bullpen, and they would get together with the editor and say, hey, look, I've got an idea, and they would come up with a rough sketch, and they'd send it to me. But, um, yeah, this I was, was one I uh, shared. This is one that I shared earlier, folks. I'll bring it back up again. You guys can see this is uh, such a great cover. I just loved it. And it's going to be a cover, by the way. If you own this book, boat, you want to make sure you squeeze it tight here because with this show coming, it's going to be one I think it's well sought after, just so you know. It's my opinion. I like that cover. Okay. So you transitioned into uh, the storyboard stuff. You did Tales of the Crypt. You did the Narnia stuff, that kind of thing. Um, I, there's a great – I don't know if it's on YouTube. 
or if I saw it somewhere else, when someone has sort of a side by side between the final product and your storyboards for Tales of the Crypt, is that a surreal process when you've done the storyboards and you see the final product of the, something like that? It's like, it's like I know when I've written something and then it got filmed and I've done like short story, short film type things, independent, like, you know, just fun stuff. Um, it's kind of it, it, surreal seeing your creation come to life in a visual media that you love and respect so much. You have to understand um, Tales of the Crypt was, was fascinating in terms of I wasn't hired to do the covers on Tales in the Crypt. I was hired to create a series of images that they could use to create the opening with. Right. And when they gave the opening to me, you know, I'm, uh, so it was a, the uh, producer that was Bill Teitler. I said, I want Bill Teitler. And he said, yeah, we need these uh, five or six different images. And he ran through the process of, yeah, this is what we're thinking of seeing, you know, for the opening of the show. And he ran through kind of the, you know, the, the ideas that he had. Well, the first thing I did was I sat down and I boarded that out as a, as a little storyboard, just for my use more than anything else. And then I took that and, and uh, I think it was myself and um, I was working in Chaikin's. We had a studio then and Richard Ory was a guy who did a lot of the background work with us. Um, I think he gave me a lot of help on, um, uh, on designing those things. And I did a series of six or seven images and brought them in to Bill along with a little storyboard. And he was, oh, you know, thanks a lot. You know, and it was, I was used to working in comics. You got paid for this stuff and it was like, whoa <laughs> <laughs> um and um so um anyway a, a month or two later uh he, bill gives me a call and he goes hey yeah we're building the set you got to drop by and 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 you know take a look so you know and he said i want to talk to you about doing a couple other things so i get there and it's one thing when you're drawing a storyboard and then you see it transition into film and that's still that's a flat image. It's a 2D image. Um, and you're removed from it in a sense. Well, all of a sudden, I'm walking into this place and I'm going, oh, my God, there's my drawings. And there are these this is this 3D, you know, it's, it, it's a 3D world. It's like, yeah, you know, it was, oh, there's the staircase I was thinking of. Oh, the, you know, there, you know, and you touch it and you realize, oops, you know, <laughs> it's just a piece of, 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 of tarp that's been painted. Um, and, and this, I just, you know, like behind us, there's nothing but a couple pieces of plywood here, but that was, that was what just astounded me. Sure. Um, but anyway, and, and, uh, and Bill said, you know, look, we're, we're so happy with what you did with this. We're thinking what we'd like to have you do is, um, um, for each of the, the stories, you know, we're going to, we're going to cut from, um, you know, to segue into them, we're going to do a comic book cover. Mm-hmm. And we want you to do the comic book covers. And, and by the way, that whole Tales in the Crypt job, um, that's something that Chaikin got for me. Uh, awesome. he, was, he was pitching scripts to um, um, uh, Joel Silver and Richard Donner, whoever. And, and I think Silver said to him, like, hey, you're a comic book guy. How would you like to draw some stuff for us? And, of course, Howard in his uh, you know, uh, irrepressible way went, I don't do drawings anymore. I'm a writer. But I know a guy who might be able to help you. I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, I you know, it. so he he brought me into that, and um, uh, it was a great gig. It it lasted ten years, and um, whatever I was making on a cover was was literally like, you know, almost ten times what I was making in comics. Were doing the same thing. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and as a kid from the Midwest, um. The first year they would give me photographs to work from and I went, nah, I know I've got to talk to, to Bill Teitler and convince him that I need to come on the set and shoot photos of these people. Cause I mean, it was just like, they're doing all the stuff and I don't get to see it. Right. Um, so, you know, he was like, Oh yeah, fine. Just come on in and you'll start shooting photographs of, of people. Um, so I, I think the first person that I met was, um, uh, geez, what was, um, from Back to the Future, uh, the the female lead, Leah uh, Thompson. Leah Thompson, and I was just astounded because I said, "Yeah, I'm thinking of this for the cover," and she just goes right into character and starts giving me these great photographs I can model from. And I'm like, "Wow, I was spoiled," because I don't think I had anybody afterwards 
who was uh, whoever did anything quite as 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 easy you know as, as useful as that. But um, I mean, for me, over the next ten years, I I literally got to meet and photograph everyone in Hollywood. I mean, it was uh, that you realize the incestuousness of of the whole business because anytime someone appeared on Tales from the Crypt, you went, oh yeah, they just finished working in a film with uh, Richard Donner, or mm. oh yeah, they're you know. Uh, I mean, there was always these, this connection. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, they're married to so and so who is, you know, uh, doing whatever. Um, and being on a movie set, it was just, it, it would always blow your mind for about 10 minutes. Let me, let me share this. Boring place in the world. Is this, let me, let me share this so I can make sure I don't grab the wrong thing. Is that yours? This? Like an electric chair, like the Crypt Keepers holding the book. It was a comic book cover. Yes. Is that yours? Yeah, yes. let's take a look at that. Okay. Um, and that's actually, what I thought. I want to make sure. Yeah, that's, that's probably the one cover. I think I did two covers I didn't do. Sean McManus was also in the studio with us, and I think he actually did that particular cover for me. And uh, Dan Spiegel uh, did one of the covers. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure whether, uh, I think Sean did his entirely on his own. He was, uh, you know, um, well, how the, the computer's not wanting to cooperate, of course, but, uh, yeah. yeah, that's awesome folks. It's just, look it up. It's, uh, the, the, these covers that were incorporated in these stories for the TV show. And it's just, it's really, it's really fascinating. I love it. So have any of that art left? Oh. Yes and no. Um, okay. We, we, all the black and white artwork is still around and a good part of his own by, oh, there's some dealer out there dealing with it. Uh, I might have a couple pieces. Um, okay. The color pieces, they were done on overlays mm -hmm. and for the first three seasons. That stuff is all in a vault at Joel's place sometime. Uh, you know, I don't know whether, whether it's gathering mold or gathering dust or then tossed <laughs> out later, who knows, but, uh, uh, for those of you in the, in the chat, though, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in. I'll try to work them in and stuff like that. Uh, I know I got I got I got literally comic book people in my chat, so who knows what kind of questions we'll circle around to. And I love it. So uh, I yeah. got to get to Narnia though, because uh, we'll run long on time. I don't want to I don't want to abuse your time here, so I'll run long on. The, I hate leaving the Tales of the Crypt because that's almost its own like documentary oh, type story, <laughs> huh? So did I. <laughs> oh, man, I bet. It's just, oh, God, I love that show. I love that stuff. I love all of it. I love Leah Thompson, too, by the way. Great name drop. The funniest thing that happened to me on Tales in the Crypt was I, yeah, I worked on it for 10 years, and then I started working for HBO Animation on Spawn. And I somehow wound it, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, in L.A., there was the two big, in Century City, there the two big Twin Tower buildings. Mm -hmm. And our offices were on the 42nd floor, which was the penthouse floor. And I wound up with the corner office because there was going to be, you know, a whole bunch of storyboard artists, but I was the only one at the time. So I had this huge office in the penthouse by the myself. second floor, completely by yourself. Completely by myself. And um, the Tales from the Crypt offices had to move there because they had moved out of their production office and they moved above us in the attic. I <laughs> 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 up and see... My uh, producer, Gil Adler, at the time, and I couldn't help but joke with him. I'm going like, Gil, you ought to come down and you ought to see my office. It's you want to come down and hang out in my office? I got plenty of room for you. <laughs> I don't think he was as amused as I was. No, probably not. Not Probably not. So, uh, awesome one is here. Thank Hey, awesome one. Um, let me let me ask you about Spawn then. So, so we briefly touched on it, that kind of thing. So same kind of thing, storyboard work for bringing the uh, animated series to life. Is that what you basically did? And Spawn was the best people I ever worked for. I worked tremendous for from everything I've heard. This is the yeah. best, best ever. Um, including Todd. I mean, he I seems I like such a real life guy working with him. He was, he was all, he was all like very nice and very personal with me. Yeah. That's what everybody says. That's what everybody says. I've not really heard people who've met him for any length of time. Um, I never actually met Todd, believe it or not. Of all my, comic book shows and conventions and stuff i've never actually gotten to meet todd it's just one of those things that never worked out i don't know why i don't know so yeah jay jay says he's a big fan of spawn with you bro big fan of spawn i want to see a really uh great 
live action stuff come to the film that would be awesome for the franchise so i gotta have time to ask about narnia because narnia has been a big part of my life the kids life and that kind of thing so quickly touch on a little bit of this crazy narnia narnia story board experience and that kind of stuff because man that world whew, it's underrated in the grand narnia scheme of really fantasy was. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, it was literally like stepping through the doorway because mm -hmm. one of the things that happens to you as an artist, uh, depending on which industry you're in, is you're on a roller coaster. If you're working in comics, comics are the hottest thing out there. Suddenly they drop. If you're working in animation. There's six shows going. Suddenly everything stops for a year and a half. And I hit a point in my career. Um, in fact, it, the the the. The irony was I had just won, um, you know, as I always like to say, one of the nicest things HBO ever bought me was a, 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 an Emmy for Spawn. Um, I directed two episodes of animation and I wound up with an Emmy. I mean, I've worked as an artist for 50 years. I've never been nominated to be nominated for anything. Uh, and I think of myself as a decent artist. And yet, I mean, there's guys that worked all their life in, in you know, in animation for that honor and it's like eh, you know it's it, it told me more about the whole the whole um award process you know it's all part of um of the um, um what publicity thing more than anything but at any rate so when i had an emmy and i discovered that it actually was a retirement gift from animation because nobody was doing anything um i couldn't find any work there comics was nothing going on and i literally i was at a point in my career where i thought i might have to go back to teaching school because i don't know you know um advertising work was very slow and i happened to run into a friend uh, another excellent um artist and comic book artist um uh, named trevor goring um uh, trevor uh did a lot of uh stuff for british comics before he uh moved here and uh, just about any movie you've ever saw in the 80s or 90s, uh, Trevor probably boarded it. But um, anyway, he said, oh, yeah, I'm working on a new film. You ought to come by and drop by a portfolio. And I said, oh, oh great, I'll do that. So, the, you know, and that, that week I came by and I went to the Narnia offices and I dropped off a portfolio. And the way those things went, I thought, well, that'll be the end of that. Because uh, I had tried to do movie storyboardings over the years. And I always wound into like, you're not in the union or we're going to do this in Arizona or, you know, there was something there. Anyway, about a month and a half, two months later, I get a call from, um, you know, saying, come in, we'd like to interview you. And I met uh, the director, Adam Adamson. And we had a you know, great chat. We talked for a while and he said, good, you know, you start on Monday. And as I'm walking out, the, the, the um, you know, production manager was just like, she's going, Wow, I've never seen him hire anybody on the same day. So it was like, oh, good. And I thought, boy, here I am working with all these union storyboard artists. I'm probably going to have to work harder. And this is going to be one of the most difficult jobs I've ever had to do. And what I discovered was it actually paid better and, and might have been a little easier than working in animation because animation, they usually tried to figure out a way to get you to do two or three jobs at once why you were paid for the one. Um, the first thing that they told me in, in, in working in live action was slow down, don't work so hard. Um, and it was just, God, it was great. I mean, I just, I love working on it. Oddly enough, I was familiar with T.S. Lewis as a philosopher, but I had missed the Narnia stuff. I mean, I had friends talk about this stuff and I was always at a loss, like, what are you talking about? You know, what's this, what's this Aslan? What's this, you know, this wardrobe stuff? Um, so, you know, um, since I got paid to read the, the books, I did. Um, and I, I had an absolute, just a great time working on that film. And um, again, one of the ironies, before the film was over, I wound up, you know, getting a credit as like a storyboard supervisor on my first job. Wow. Awesome. Uh, well, no, oddly enough, after I storyboarded the three films, finding any more work in film was very difficult because I wasn't in the union. And, and so that, that kept me out of a lot of the stuff. Mm. Um, and it was also at a time when I was kind of winding down my career. So, uh, you know, I wasn't looking for a lot more, but, um, 
one of the more interesting things that I saw in, in Narnia was um, we were planning on having, a, uh, I think it was like a, a, a May or a June shoot, in, and they were going to go to, to, I think, uh, South America to shoot it so they could get the winter scenes in. Mm-hmm. And somehow the, you know, the, the studio they were going to work at or whatever, I think, one, I think one was in London, one was there, it burnt down and they couldn't do it. So they had to work in it, you know, they said, well, we can't shoot it this year, but we're going to continue to do pre-production stuff on the film. So we want to keep you and uh, I had my other friend, Tom Nelson, who um, uh, Tom was another uh, friend from animation and we moved into live action. And um, actually he and his wife and I all shared space at uh, um, uh, you know, working on Spawn. Uh, we all, you know, they were all, we were all board artists on that show. Okay. So you were all connected and knew everybody. Right. Yeah. And, uh, we all, you know, um, Tom and Jen weren't married there, but, uh, we all started sharing office together. And I came home and I told my wife, I said, eh, those two are going to be together pretty soon. Um, <laughs> and, uh, she was like, oh, you're crazy. You know, I was actually right for once. Um, but in, in, like I said, we all wound up winning an Emmy for that show. Um, Tom and I were satisfied with that. Jem actually went on. She got nominated for an Oscar for. Uh, um, she was the uh, director on Kung Fu Panda Three. Oh wow! First, yeah. the first woman who was nominated uh, in, as a solo director on, um, you know, on an animated project. Wow. Um, awesome. But anyway, Tom and I worked uh, on the Narnia stuff. Uh, we wound up getting an extra uh, in instead of the the four three or four months we were going to work, we wound up working 16 months. That's amazing. And well, not only was it amazing, but I've got, I've got no complaint because yeah. before then I was, you know, I was like, Oh, you know, what's, what's this month's rent going to be like? Yeah. The check clears and you just keep on doing yeah. what you love. It's amazing. Um, and, um, and the other thing was, that struck me was, you know, when they told me what my salary was going to be, they were they're, they, you know, they kind of apologized and they're going, we're just going to pay, pay the base rate the base union rate, I'm going, wow, that's about time and a half what I'd make in animation. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it was, crazy what a difference it is in these different industries in that time. It's crazy. I, I always had a pyramid when I looked at jobs in terms of there were three things. What's the job? How much are you paying me? Who are you going to work with? Mm. And I found that, you know, the important one was who are you going to work with? For the, I, a lot of the jobs I've had over the years, I thought I've done excellent work on, but I wasn't that interested in the material, but I always did the best that I could do on it. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, it was, mm-hmm. it was like I gave, I gave a good solid job on it. Sure. Um, and the pay, you know, uh, hopefully it was always good. Uh, the thing that could ruin a job for you in a minute was who you were working with. Um, if they weren't good people. Right. With, right. with, HBO and, um, you know, like Tales from the Crypt, HBO and Narnia. I had the best of those three worlds in all those jobs. That's the best uh, to hear. It was, it was absolutely just, uh, you know, like, like the best of times. The best people I worked with was fun material and, um, um, you know, and, and it paid really well. So. This was a, a big fan thing. I think we underestimated the Spawn love out here. People talking about the comic book. And then later, Jace was chiming about the animated series. Spawn was the first DVD series I ever got as a child in the 18 and over movie store. Had a lot of horror and horror and movie shows, music, etc. that you could not get because he lives in Norway. So a lot of that stuff you couldn't get, uh, couldn't get American stuff. The animated series Spawn was a big part of my heart, big part of my life. And he says, uh, also once I saw the animated series during a free weekend on HBO, man. Yeah, bro. It was, and it was. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. So, people are saying I love your work, man. People are saying I love your work, stuff like that's the uh, the consensus blowing out of the chat on over there for us. And uh, yeah, I couldn't believe uh, the resume, the fun experience, and then knowing that you've also had a great experience. I don't know. It just kind of even makes it better. It even makes it better to know that's the other part of that story. That's that's so awesome. I mean, one of the other things that happened to me on on um, uh, working at HBO. Um, I, I told our, our, our Catherine Winder, who was our, uh, uh, producer on the show said, Hey, you know, 
we're doing all this New York stuff in the background. I said, our HBO offices are in New York. Why don't you just have somebody there go out and shoot some photos of some interesting stuff in New York that we can use on background in the show? She goes, well, why don't you do that? <laughs> sure. Why not? Is it pay? <laughs> hey, I don't know New York um, you know, that well. And B, I'm in California. I mean, in animation, the idea of sending someone to scout a location and bring back photographs, it's like, you don't do that stuff. Yeah. Definitely, and, definitely a long way from the comic book world. <laughs> with, um, uh, who's, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Cooper, who's another he did mm. in independent comic books. And um, uh, Peter got one of his friends to take me around. He said, I'm going to show you places in New York that if you lived here for 30 years, you've never seen. Mm. And we just went to all these alleys and rooftops. And uh, I mean, I just did nothing but shoot film for three days and brought them back. And, um, and that was that was what we used for reference for uh, so much of the um, uh, the spawn material, um, and and after that, I had never been out of the country when I was fifty, and my wife and I went to England. You know, um, at the time, just about the time we started in um, at HBO, and I jokingly said to my wife on the way home, I said, "Well, hey, that was a lot of fun. Uh, next year we'll do Asia." <laughs> and I got back. I hadn't been back a month, and and Catherine says to me. So have they talked to you about Japan yet? Uh oh, and, uh oh, he's going uh, on a plane trip. Oh, uh, what, what? And so I wound up going to Japan, Hong Kong, and Korea, um, and and bringing my wife along for part of that. So it was basically doing photo scouting for storyboard animation and stuff. Right, and same thing in the Narnia films. I wound up in going to uh, New Zealand two or three times, and then we spent um, three or four months in Prague. Um, so awesome. It, it destroyed me forever traveling again because the idea that I'd actually have to travel and pay for it myself. Uh, it's like, well, I can't do that. That's too much to take. You know, <laughs> it's, well, it's also like you usually get put up cause I've had a little bit of this dabble from the press standpoint. And they used to kind of wind it down. You're So you're in a pretty decent hotel. Well, sometimes there's some meals they're taken care of. You know, you got for good per diem. Sometimes you're like, you start thinking about it coming out of your own pocketbook. You're like, I can never live up to that. I'm going to, my wife's going to be so disappointed if I'm the one writing the check. <laughs> So I better just not go back there. <laughs> well, one of the great things about Prague was by the time that I got, I mean, by the time we were working in Prague, my part of the film was done. But Andrew wanted us, you know, uh, around just in case he needed other stuff, you know, done. So, I mean, I never had more than two or three hours work a day to do. Everybody else on the production is working 16 hours a day, you know, trying because they're, mm -hmm. they're jamming. Um but I would like grab uh, Justin Sweet, who was one of the illustrators, and we would go. We hit all the Mooka museums all over Prague, uh, and that was so that cool. was a real treat for me. Well, we have to uh, again. Again, I want to make sure I give you plenty of time. I want to really make get everybody all pumped up for this. It's so exciting to see. Uh, great, great way to share your art. The Lori Lovecraft's Omnibus is coming. Lori is uh, the 25th anniversary. We're going to be uh, seeing stuff here in a couple weeks where it will be available. Let me see if I hit the right button and pinned your website to the top. Let me go back to the chat, see if I can find it. Got it right here. I'm going to pin it to the top, folks. Nope, this is putting user timeout. All right, I have to do it on the other page. Anyway. Uh, I, there's definitely be links in the description over at vazart.com. You can go to vazart.com and that will uh, be where you can get the information. There will be links in the description. Uh, talk a little bit about the idea of you even doing this, Mike. What, where did this, where did this kind of, how this sort of birth and come into being? Well, first off, what you have to understand is um, the omnibus this stuff, I started working on it 25 years ago. Um, I mean, when I was doing regular comics, this was in the middle of the comic boom in the in the 80s and 90s, where everybody was doing their own. You know, there were every there was like a new company, you know, cropping up every week. And I had a friend uh, who who was a, a distributor said, you know, you got to do your own comic, Mike. And you know, I I I I publish it for you. So I went okay, and so I started working on this thing. And meanwhile. Um, things were kind of, you know, uh, bottomed out as I was talking about before. Um, and so I wound up, um, 
I, I created the first issue of the comic. Um, and I think I, I eventually had um, Caliber Comics. They were a company back then who did the first two or three issues of these. Um, and I think we did five or six of them all together. And uh, over the years, I've continued to draw stories with, you know, with Lori Lovecraft in it. And again, she came out of Tales from the Crypt. Mm -hmm. Every week when I show up on the, you know, on the set, there'd be this new young hot actress who was in somebody's movie or was somebody's girlfriend. And she had the lead in the show. And six months later, none of us were ever going to hear from her again, unfortunately. Gotcha. And that was Lori. I mean, Lori was just, you know, one more of these, you know, these like, you know, beautiful young women who had no idea where to go with, with, you know, with what was happening with them. Um, with Lori, uh, she decides to turn to sorcery. Uh, she's not really any better at sorcery than she is at, at acting, but at least it, it, you know, makes for some interesting stories. Um, the other thing for me was in drawing the stories, it gave me a chance to cast all of my favorite uh, actors over the years. So, I mean, of course, in the first story, there's Boris Karloff. In the second story, there's William Powell. In the third story, it's all, it's an Alfred Hitchcock character. Uh, fourth story, you've got, you know, Robert Mitchum. Uh, the fifth story was a road movie with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Um, and so for me, it was just, it was this labor of love. I got to draw these characters um, and, um, you know, and uh, I continued to draw Lori. I mean, and she was just a conglomeration of all of the, um, uh, you know, the, the beautiful blonde of the, uh, um, and actually Lori's a redhead. But um, so, I mean, I was looking at Anne Margaret uh, and uh, Jane Fonda, Catherine Deneuve. I mean, they were they're pretty much my models for the character. Um, and um, um, I had a lot of fun doing doing uh, the thing. And um, my agent, uh, James Mealy, said, Mike, you know, she's going to be 25 years old. Um, which was, of course, kind of the joke of the series was uh, was that uh, at 25, Lori had to retire from movies because she was already too old. You know, <laughs> um, working in comics, I could relate to that. Um, and um, uh, so I said, hey, that's a great idea. We'll do a 25th anniversary book. So I put together, you know, the the, the previous stories we did, and then we did uh, a couple new pieces and – uh, there's other little, um, you know, there's, there's lots of, looks like there's a pinup section in there. Um, there's, um, you know, like I said, there's, there's a new story. One of the things is also like prints and stuff too. You have special prints that you can, people can add on for only a few dollars, man. It's just these beautiful prints that are just, they're just beautiful. Right. Gorgeous. Um, I also put together a full color comic book, which I'm, I'm selling separate because all the, um, the Lori Lovecraft stories were always in black and white. Um, and the other thing is the, the Lori Lovecraft stories were always about Lori and her career in Hollywood and the people she met. Um, I figured that, that when Lori was in Hollywood, she also made these really cheesy films because that's what an actress would do in those times. So this book is actually, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, one of Lori's films called dark inheritance with her and her, uh, her boyfriend, Bob Hope, or in this case, uh, uh, Alan Roberts. Uh, so it's, it's like, it's a Lori Lovecraft movie. Um, and at the back end of the book, long before I did Lori Lovecraft for star reach comics, I used to do, uh, a feature. I used to do Linda Lovecraft. Um, and what I discovered about Linda Lovecraft was everyone I met constantly was asking me, Oh, you're the one who's doing those Linda Lovelace comics. It was of course Linda Lovelace was you know the big porn star at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like no no no, and I I was I was I was always interested that like you know aunts and, and my aunts that I knew and and people I'd run into, they knew a lot more about porno stars than they did about uh, H.P. Lovecraft as a writer. So it was like you know, yeah. Okay. So um, I did four or five stories for Star Reach with with um, you know with Linda Lovecraft and they were fun, but I mean. I had absolutely no idea who this character was other than like, yeah, she's fun to draw, you know, and, and I was doing the same thing. I mean, I was doing a, 
uh, Casablanca, Pastiche, and, and they were about movies for the most part. Um, so when I did Lori Lovecraft, I, I did the first smart thing was I, I, I talked to my friend Peter Benvella, who was uh, into you know, movies and, and, uh, and uh, producing documentaries and things, um, into writing the series. And he brought an infinite step forward in terms of what I was doing. Um, and, um, but, uh, in the back of the book, like I said, there's, there's some of the Linda Lovecraft stories. And there's also one that was never published that, um, we're talking about GI Joe. I, I did, uh, a story where, oh, hang um, on, let me, let me switch my, the there we go. Characters. I don't know. Let's, I'm always having, I'm turning it the wrong way. I'm sorry. You know, yeah, not, yeah, you got it. I, I, I was trying to, I, I pulled the other screen up. Yeah. Look at that. So I put together this, uh, oh, shadow this, right there, uh, a story where, uh, death comes to visit Lori Lovecraft. And, um, um, meanwhile, she's staying at the same place where this convention of all these fighters who are all the, the Cobras and the GI Joes and are going to get into a married, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a major firefight. And of course, you know, the villain behind this is Cobra commander and he gets unmasked. And, uh, uh, of course I, I did have a bit of fun. It's like when he's unmasked, he's, uh, um, actually was, you know, I, I did my, my little, uh, you know, Larry Hama drawing there. So, uh, I haven't oh, chased Larry yet, so I'll probably it's get gonna, an angry phone call someday. I was going to say, Larry's going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows who you are in this story, Larry. I'm going to have Larry sign that page for me. I'm just going to okay. put a little sticky note for my kids and like, yeah, that's actually Larry right there. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because I never took the story past just doing little pencil sketches. You know, I mean, they're basically little storyboards. and um, Right. Uh, but it was... It was kind of like, because I, I G.I. Joe was a good job. And I enjoyed working on Larry's stories, but man, every book you had another 30 new characters that were sloshing your way through and they'd be mm. in three frames and you go on to the next one. And uh, I did you another book. Like a that lot in those issues. The, yeah. um, uh, what was it? The Secret Society of Supervillains or whatever. Mm -hmm. And every book, it was just like you're running through like 20 different characters. And, um, uh, it, it, um, my mind doesn't work that way. I'm sure George Perez would have had an absolute riot doing it, but, uh, uh, for do me, you have to do, like, I, this is really going to, I mean, we're going to go back to comic book question, I guess, along with, do you have to do some research a little bit sometimes to like figure out who some of these characters are to get enough framework to stay loyal to them and stuff like that? Do you spend a lot of time? Cause I mean, some of this stuff can be kind of obscure sometimes with they, Oh, by the way, we're going to have these three villains in this. And it's like, I barely know who these three are or something like that. Or how did you approach it? Uh, I didn't. Okay. Uh, when I write my own work, I do that work. Mm. Okay. And I mean, uh, I'll never forget when I was working on Shang-Chi, um, I got a script one time from the writer, uh, said page one, Shang-Chi's on the beach, page two to 17 fight, make it interesting. Then page 18, Shang-Chi wraps up. Well, I turned the job in, and of course, he complained to the editor that I didn't make it very interesting. And I thought, oh, geez, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll give you back my writing fee. Oh, wait, I didn't get one, did I? You know, mm -hmm. And I mean, it was, it was um, in terms of the characters, I wasn't being paid at Marvel to create characters for them. I was being paid, or DC or whoever, um, I was being paid to draw the character. Um, I mean, I, I found the same thing in animation that was always you know, like, uh, oh, you know, we don't have character designs yet on uh, these characters, but uh, I draw the way you think they'll, they'll work and we'll use mm -hmm. those. You know? And, you know, and, and usually, you know, as artists, we're like, oh, cool, I get to do them myself. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you get to do them for free too. Um, when I was younger, I might have, gotten into a little bit of that but the older you get you realize oh, i'm just being used here so, mm, right the so, wisdom um, yeah in, in terms of research if someone said this story takes place in paris i would do research on paris mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if someone said the story has iron man and the thing i'm not gonna have to do research on iron man and the thing because 
they're already established. I mean, right. I can I can find out like okay who drew them that I liked and I'll draw them that way. Okay, right. As an artist, I would I would approach it that way, but um, I wasn't involved in the writing on those stories. It's funny because Ethan Van Skyver shared a story about when he was working with Grant Morrison on one of the X Men's in the first panel. Or the, the instructive story was, um, you know, Wolverine standing on a stack of these bodies or something. It was very vague. And I guess he reached out and Grant Morrison was like, it doesn't matter. It's just they're just a bunch of bastards. And I just remember him telling that story and I just laughed out loud. Uh, having met Grant Morrison and knowing they only met him once, you could tell he didn't want to be there. <laughs> You know, no offense to some of the comic book creators. It's like you feel like the agent just got them into it because he was really there to promote something that was coming up. And it was like, OK, he didn't really want to be there. Um, and then you hear that story. And you're like, yeah, you can just see, you know, what the writers and the artists and then how all of these nuances are working. And then, you know, to know that, oh, by the way, yeah, just just do it. Just do it, Mike. Make it interesting. Just make it interesting. Like, OK, well thanks for that what is that supposed to mean and then to complain about it it's like oh gosh okay yeah and, anyway. and, and the other side of that coin like i said is then you'd work with writers like larry or shaken or or uh, god i loved working with um terry austin mm -hmm. um you know um oh geez one of my favorites was mike Barron. mike Barron. oh mike Barron's a his, boss you know, typewritten script from him you get these pages with little scribbles on them and you know, and the dialogue written in, and it was it was the best direction I could get because he had a visual idea of what should go in each frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, working on you know with guys like that on those stories, it was all that was that was a dream. Um, you know, one one of the problems with comics is it's a. Uh, I'm I'm sure all the entertainment media is, but comics especially, uh, it really attracts your ego and trying to put up with ego in comics. A lot of times, I mean, I remember I was pitching a story or, or a series um, to um, uh, one of my friends, uh, you know, who's an editor uh, at, at Marvel and he was going, that's a great idea. I think it's going to work really good, but we probably should, really should see if we got a name to go with you for, you know, for this, you know, to sell it to whoever. And I started to laugh and I said, well, you know, whatever name you're going to get in comics still only has an audience of, you know, a few, maybe a hundred thousand, a couple hundred thousand people. Everything I work on every day, 50 to a hundred million people see every day. Right. I was working on, you know, on, on Tales from the Crypt and, yep. and even the and film. Yeah. And, you know, he kind of you know, laughed sheepishly and he said, I understand it completely. He said, but I still have to sell it to, to the people mm -hmm. at the top who they want their names. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, you're, you know, you're a, you know, you get to be a big fish in a small pond type of thing. Yeah. Back when the, the comic book trades were a thing, man, that's all they did was promoting creative teams and putting this name with that name. And, Oh, it was like, Oh, who could we get on? It's like, you know, guys, I don't know. I mean, that, that's fine. I just, you know, I want good. I just want good. I just want good. So well, glad you yeah. name dropped Mike Barron. Mike Barron's a boss, folks. If you are not really into Mike Barron, Jay's Fox, he's a good friend. So you need to hook a brother up, man. I'll, I'll talk to Mike. I haven't talked to Mike. He's got a he's got a um, Indiegogo going on right now. I'm gonna talk to Mike. That when you bit. talk to Mike, tell him I said hi. He's a good guy. Yeah, player. he is. He is good. So, um, so listen, it's vozart.com. You can get yourself uh, connected. Uh, get your email. Shoot him an email. RSVP your copy of the omnibus. I'll up on Facebook. Facebook, we'll get you the link there, and uh, you know you can connect to Mike. Make sure you get your copy. We will uh, circle back around when he actually has a drop. He'll let me know so I can kind of repost things and remind you to get your copy and that kind of thing. I'm very excited for Mike. Very excited, and it's so much fun. It's beautiful. Love it so much. But Jay says, "Let's get both mics on with you, pops." <laughs> I we could tell some interesting stories. I bet there would be some great. I, I won't have to do anything. I can just just sit here and run the computer. That's all I have to do. I guess got to stay out of the way. Just watching the watching the legends talk and chat about all the stuff. Cause that's 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 fun time. Good point, Jace. Thank you very much, my friend, my my boy. So, Mike, thank you again for fitting us into your busy schedule, man. Talking about your stuff and your journey and that kind of thing. And uh, we can do this again, man. It's good stuff. We barely cracked the surface in some of these things, I'm sure. You know, you know, I realize I have a full time job that I have to do every day. Um, mm. I, I opened the door for my cat 
to make yep. sure she's in and out when she needs to. That, that's so, important yeah. for the cat. The cat cares a lot. <laughs> Especially, I, I tell people, because they say, oh, you're retired now. And I'm going, yeah, I do the same thing I did every day for 50 years, except now I don't get paid for it. Uh, but I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm every day working on, you know, an illustration or, or comics. I never do storyboards for, for some reason, because it's like with film, I'm not going to have the opportunity to, to give those boards to anybody. But um, comics, they were my first love. And that's kind of what I've come back to now in terms of, um, you know, besides the Lori, I also do a feature called Retrowood, which is about a kind of a faux Hollywood in the 30s. And uh, A Mad Mummy was a, a, a kind of a, you know, a, a, another, you know, horror thing that I did and things like that. But uh, I've enjoyed those quite a bit. It's awesome. Thank you so much again. Uh, it's been great. And uh, thanks for the chat. Love you guys making all this happen. You're the reason we do it and appreciate it so much. Uh, go there, check all that out. Uh, and again, Jay says, you know, Mike Voss was a big part of my childhood. And one day, man, we need to do something. Yeah, we'll figure something out, man. Jace, we'll get you connected somehow. He's a great dude. You like and, it. So. And by the way, while I will often have bad things to say about companies and even sometimes other people I work with, fans, I I'm always astounded. They're like, oh, thank you so much, you know, just for your support. It's just, uh, just hearing people tell you stuff about your art, it's like, you just made my day. Yeah, and like, I, and I always try to be careful too, because I don't want to try to drag Marvel and DC or indie comics or, or the film companies or well, whatever anyway, because reality, <laughs> they made it, they made it happen for us all. I mean, there's always, you work for any company, you're going to have some stories from different things, different people, whatever. Let's just, just be honest. Doesn't matter. I work in healthcare. It's the same kind of thing. I don't want to drag my companies because I had a bad supervisor. Or I had this situation. Fine. You know, reality is, you know, it's just part of our life's journey, folks. And you, you make tomorrow better than today. Make this week important in your life. Keep working and following your dreams. And Mike's been an inspiration for us. And it's been great to share that with you guys. And like I said, Lori Lovecraft, head over to VazArt.com. Links are there. Thanks again for your time and uh, appreciate all of it.